Good morning. morning. Welcome to First Christian Reformed Church of South Holland. We are glad to uh, gather together on this beautiful Lord's Day. Glad that you could join us. Special welcome if you're visiting uh, with us today. And uh, we are indeed uh, uh, assembling here with great anticipation of what the Lord will do in speaking through His Word today and uh, working by the power of His Spirit. So we give thanks to the Lord for the gospel of Christ the Word of God that uh, summons us to the true worship of God in spirit and in truth, opportunity to see one another and encourage uh, one another as well. Uh, A couple of things to mention before we begin. As you can see, there is a a fellowship lunch that's scheduled uh, two weeks from today, Sunday, August 1st, and so there are uh, sign-up sheets uh, in the back for that. And uh, even if you can't make something, you are are welcome to attend. So that's two weeks uh, from today after our morning worship service. Well, as we do each week, let's uh, take a few moments in silent prayer and ask God to prepare our hearts uh, to hear from Him. Hopefully you've had some time to do that already, uh, to ask God to, uh, to be with us as we worship. But let's take a few moments now and uh, come before the Lord in silent prayer, and then I'll bring us together with a prayer of invocation. Let's pray. Eternal, almighty, and most gracious God, heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool. Holy and reverend is your name. You are praised by the angels of heaven and in the gathering of your church on earth. And despite our unworthiness, you have invited us through our mediator, Jesus Christ, to present ourselves and our prayers to you. Receive us graciously. Help us by your Spirit. Let us stand in awe of you. Put your law into our hearts and write it on our minds. Let your word come to us today in power and help us to receive it in love with humble, attentive, reverent, and teachable minds. Through your word, allow us to taste the flavor of eternal life. Make us fervent in prayer and joyful in praise. Help us to serve you this day without distraction, that we may find that a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere, and that it is good to come near to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. If you're able, please stand for a call to worship and take your bulletin. From Revelation 4. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. Let's go to number 100 in our red hymnal. Number 100, holy, 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 remain standing as we sing.
and people of God, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Receive God's greeting this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Please take your bulletin once again. Let's remain standing and affirm our faith using these words from Colossians chapter 1. As we bring our attention to focus on Jesus Christ, our Savior, mediator, prophet, priest, and king, let's join our voices together with one, with one, uh, as one as we say these words. Christians, what do you believe? Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Let's be seated. For our call to confession, I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 19, familiar account, and uh, we have read it as a call to confession before, but it's been a while and uh, good to remind ourselves of these words. This is the account of, of Jesus' interaction with the rich young man. And so I'll read from Matthew 19, beginning in verse 16, as we consider this, uh, this interaction, conversation between Jesus and this man who comes to him. Matthew 19, verse 16. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. It's very interesting to think about the, uh, the interaction between Jesus and the rich young man here as Jesus is putting before this man the blessed life, the good life, obey the commandments, keep the commandments, He says, all these I have kept, elsewhere in another account of this, all these I have kept since my youth. And as Jesus is putting these things to him, of course, in our minds, we are called to remember that Jesus truly has kept all of these since his his youth. He had more right to say that uh, than this rich young man did. But then think about what he puts to the man. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. This, of course, greatly distresses the rich young man, for he is rich. But once again, Jesus is calling us to remember the work that he has done. For he had all riches in the universe, far beyond gold or or silver, monetary wealth. He had the riches of eternal glory, as we just affirmed in Colossians chapter 1. The image of the invisible God, by him all things were created, things visible and invisible, all things were created through him and for him. In that sense, we think Jesus had it all. Son of God, 
had it all. But he laid it aside. He did not exploit his position, but rather uh, came to earth, took on human flesh. He who was rich became poor so that those who were poor might become rich. And so as Jesus says, who can be saved? Well, with man, it's, it's impossible. All of our striving will amount to nothing. But with God, all things are possible. And that begins with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who uh, was the one who laid aside, did not exploit his position, who became poor, who humbled himself so that he might redeem us, so that he might bring us into a state of grace, so that he might unite us to himself and to his life, and so that that gospel call that comes before us, that We are to gladly, joyfully give up what we have in order to serve Him, in order to glorify Him. All things pale in comparison to Him. Without the new life of Christ, we would never never do that. But with the new life of Christ, we, we gladly, joyfully take up our cross and follow Him, knowing that He has won salvation for us. And all of that, of course, humbles us and reminds us to strive Uh, to remain in communion and fellowship with Christ, uh, that as we live day by day and week by week, we we struggle, we stumble in many ways, and it's good to use the Lord's Day to to refresh with our knowledge, our trust, and uh, and our fellowship with the Lord. So let us bring our sins before the Lord. We know that in our daily practice of repentance, we are not winning salvation back, Uh, but we are uh, renewing that communion with God, and the light of His countenance might be refreshed and and, and lifted up upon us. So let us take uh, some moments now and uh, confess our sins together in a time of prayer. We'll have a time of uh, silent confession in this prayer, too. Let's pray. God, we confess that You are our Maker, and often we forget this central truth, We often make attempts at at fashioning a law of righteousness that is the product of our own minds because we inherently know that your righteous standard is beyond our ability to keep. We confess that at times we are dissatisfied with your law and commandments and we justify breaking your law here and there. We rationalize, we defend our actions. We confess that we do not use your law rightly, that we do not meditate upon it in the watches of the night, that we have not always hidden it in our hearts, and for that we beg your mercy. We ask that as we come to the fountain of life now, the waters of grace, that you would enliven in us a lasting desire to treasure each and every word that you give to us, the commandments and the promises. We ask that by the power of the Spirit we would put to death the deeds of the body, that we might live. We humbly ask your mercy that you would bring holiness to completion in the fear of God in us, and that for Christ's sake you would renew his image in us, that we might show forth your light to this world that is so often steeped in darkness and sin. We also bring before you in the silence of these moments our individual and particular sins. Bring them to our mind as we confess them to you now. We pray all of these things knowing that it is your great joy to forgive, that you are a forgiving God. You are mighty and merciful, and we ask that you forgive us of all unrighteousness and cleanse us and renew us today. For Jesus' sake, amen. Hear this proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. Lift up your hearts to the truth of these words. In Acts 13, we read this, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through Jesus Christ forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. He who was rich became poor, so that those who were poor might become rich. Look to Christ and trust in him. Believe in his work in faith and repentance. And if you do so, there is salvation and forgiveness, full and free, in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Let us sing a song of uh, thanksgiving as we reflect on these gospel truths. Number 80 in our red hymnal, Lord, with glowing heart, I'd praise thee. Let's stand together and sing number 80 in the red hymnal. pray. Heavenly Father, we do express and acknowledge that our words can never be enough. We can never climb to the, the heights of your, of your glory and your love, your forgiveness and your mercy. And so we ask that uh, you would work in us mightily today We ask that you would enable us to let our lives supplement our profession, that our lives would show forth thy praise. We know that even still we will will fall short of of your glory, and that our life will not be an an adequate um, display of all that you have done for us. And uh, yet we know that you look upon us in Christ as your children, that you love us, uh, that you are with us, that you never leave us nor forsake us, that you call us to, to live for you and, and to obey and to serve you, and that our service done for you from a genuine heart in Christ is pleasing unto you. So make our lives pleasing to you. Uh, make our, our, our work, our, 
a day-to-day vocation. Uh, make it pleasing unto you in your sight in Christ Jesus and by the power of your Spirit. Help us to fight temptation and to mortify sin, to, to kill the sin that is in our lives, that, that lingers and that uh, is always seeking to gain a foothold in our hearts and in our lives. And, oh, Father, we know that you have supplied us with, with everything that we need in every situation. Everything for life and godliness you have given to us. Your word, you've given us through the gospel of grace, our standing in Christ, and the spirit that has been given to us. So we know there, uh, there are no excuses. And so, Father, we ask that you would allow us to, uh, to treasure all of those things that you give to us. And uh, that you uh, would continue to sanctify us in your word and in your truth. We ask that you would do that today. Speak through your servant as we uh, think through these very things, uh, making our life a, a testament of your, of your gospel and making our lives about your glory and not just hearing the word, but doing the word. Speak through your servant. May you cleanse him of, of everything that uh, would prevent uh, your word, your truth from going forth. We pray, O oh Father, that you would be with us as a congregation. Uh, we Thank you for the many, many years you have given to us, and we pray that you would continue to do so. Be with the elders, the deacons, and we pray that you would enable them to do their work well. We thank you for the newly installed officers of this church and for providing for us in that way. We pray for those of us who are experiencing great hurt or sorrow. Pray for those who are sick and afflicted. We do thank you that uh, Eleanor Vandergeesen was able to move to rehab late in the week. We praise you for that. Pray that you be with Lynn Van Beek in his upcoming surgery, and we entrust uh, you for that. Be with his doctors as, uh, as they attend to him. Be with uh, the many of those in our congregation who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Be with those who are undergoing relational strife, and we, we pray that you would restore what has been broken. Uh, We thank you for the many families that are represented in our congregation. Uh, Be with them, the marriages of our church. Pray that you would be with those uh, who are single or widowed, and we pray that uh, you would encourage them. And we thank you that uh, you call all of us to look to Christ and to seek to serve you in in the various places in which we uh, live and, and work and move every day. And we thank you that you do not have a basic criteria, list of criteria for how we might serve you, uh, but that you call us to yourself through the gospel. And uh, you equip us to serve you and to serve one another. Bring forth our giftedness uh, that you have given to each of us in the spirit that we might know how to serve the body of Christ. Be with our missionaries that, uh, as they work and grant them what they need. And we pray that the kingdom of God might uh, advance through this world. We pray for the, the mission fields that we see, both close to home and, and far away. Well, Father, equip us that we might be salt and light in our world. And that we might be ready to testify to Jesus Christ and to your goodness in him. And that we would be a peculiar people on this earth knowing that you have called us out and called us to seek holiness. So may we do that uh, for, for your glory and by your power. We pray, O oh Father, that you would accept now these offerings that we give, both to the Benevolent Fund and to the work of the church. We pray that you would make us, uh, uh, we ask that you would make us a praying people and teach us to pray, uh, to fill our lives with prayer, to look to the example of Christ who prayed long hours that he might uh, commune with you, O Father. Teach us to pray even after the manner of his instruction as we say together with one voice, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. Our offering today, first for the Benevolent Fund, second for the General Fund. Let's sing a song of preparation, number 240, in the Blue Psalter hymnal. Words from Psalm 119. Teach me, O Lord, thy way of truth. Teach me, O Lord, thy way of truth. Number 240, let's stand together and sing.
We have an Old Testament reading from Ezekiel 33. Here in this chapter, the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel, and the Lord calls him a watchman. He is like a watchman on the wall. And uh, because of his word, it is to move the Israelites uh, to action, to do something as he gives them uh, the warning of, uh, that comes from the Lord. And so we're going to think about some of those things today as we then turn our attention to James, but this will be an appropriate uh, passage to to bring our attention to some of them. So give your attention to the reading of God's holy word in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 1, God's holy and inspired word. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, speak to your countrymen and say to them, when I bring the sword against a land... And the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman. And he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people. Then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes his life, his blood will be on his own head. Since he heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning, his blood will be on his own head. If he had taken warning, he would have saved himself. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes the life of one of them, that man will be taken away because of his sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for his blood. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, That wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his ways, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Son of man, say to the house of Israel, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Therefore, son of man, say to your countrymen, the righteousness of the righteous man will not save him when he disobeys, and the wickedness of the wicked man will not cause him to fall when he turns from it. The righteous man, if he sins, will not be allowed to live because of his former righteousness. If I tell the righteous man that he will surely live, but then he trusts in his righteousness and does evil, none of the righteous things he has done will be remembered. He will die for the evil he has done. And if I say to the wicked man, you will surely die, but he then turns away from his sin and does what is just and right, if he gives back what he took in pledge for a loan, returns what he has stolen, follows the decrees that give life, and does no evil, he will surely live. He will not die. None of the sins he has committed will be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right. He will surely live. Amen. And then go forward to James, the book of James, chapter 1. James 1, verses 22 through 25. We'll read verse 21, and we'll get uh, some reference to that today. So we'll begin at verse 21, James 1. This is God's holy word. Give your attention to its reading. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And then our passage for today. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your word humbly and we are struck by the simplicity of these words and, and uh, yet we know that we need your grace in order to live uh, according to them. So would you uh, be abundantly gracious today and uh, from your storehouse of goodness, would you make your blessings flow uh, far as the curse is found in this place that we might live for you and glorify you. In Christ's name, amen. In ancient cultures, the watchman's word was meant to propel you into fervent action. Probably there were many different jobs that people had when the sword was coming against the city. Uh, so many people had different responsibilities to do in that moment, but the point was you need to, to get right to doing it. Uh, in our house, the uh, severe weather siren is a lot like the watchman on the wall. Uh, we, we have some fear of, of storms, thunderstorms, windstorms, and then that windstorm that happened, I think it was last summer. And uh, so if it's not Tuesday at 10 o'clock a.m., and uh, that severe weather siren goes off, there are some, some littler ones in our house that are immediately moved into action. Uh, I tend to, to think it's my responsibility to walk outside when I hear that and, and try to see the storm. I like to see uh, storms coming from afar. Sometimes I like to, uh, to watch them unfold. Uh, the, the, the six and four-year-old in our house don't like that. Right? They, they want to go right to the basement they want everyone to be in, in, uh, in the basement. So sometimes we have the problem of, is this an ambulance or a fire truck, or is it the severe weather siren? But the point is, it, it propels them into doing something, uh, into action. And that is what James is speaking about in today's passage. The Word of God is meant to uh, put us into action based upon what it says. We think about last week, the, the passage that we considered. Right? If, you, if you are sinfully angry, receive with meekness the power of God's Word. Uh, it is God's Word. It is the power of God's Word. It is accepting it that will allow you to see uh, your habits and behaviors change. And much of that is reinforced today but as James teaches us this. To, to receive or accept the Word of God means to do what it says or to strive to do what it says. If we are not striving to do what the Word of God says with all of our might, with all of the strength that God provides, then we are not humbly accepting. Uh, we are not receiving with meekness the Word that is planted in us. And so that, that is how that connects to last week's passage. So we uh, are then confronted with this question uh, what kind of a knower are you? Or how do you know the Word of God? What, what is it that you know about it? And what is the nature of your knowledge? When I was growing up, I uh, attended government schools. You might know them as uh, public schools, but I call them government schools because I found out over the course of my life the public doesn't have much to do with uh, what is being taught there, but I digress. Uh, one of the things that's beautiful, of course, about Christian education is that it's able to take uh, the vast knowledge of this world, to see the order of this world, uh, to see history that has gone before us. We're able to tie it all together 
into a, a whole training, a holistic training of the human being to be oriented towards the glory of God. And, and really, one of the key, when, when Christian education is operating correctly, one of the things that is emphasized is that all of the things that we know, we really don't know them truly until we have them pointed towards the glory of God, until we see the way in which it propels us to be a person who serves the Lord. If all of the knowledge that we have, if if it's not for God's glory, then we have missed it. And that goes for our knowledge of the Bible as well. If it's not for God's glory, if it doesn't bring us into a life that is lived more for Him, then we have missed it. Scripture, when it is rightly understood, is seeking to use us as instruments for God and His glory. And yet, sinfully often, it is used as an instrument itself for pride, success, or glory, or some other sinful end. Scripture, God's Word, confronts us, it summons us, it commands us, it directs us all by the power of His Spirit. The overarching uh, theme of the scriptures is, is not a school, but a covenant. And this was uh, Dutch theologian Gerhardus Voss who made this wonderful observation. Scripture is not a school. It is a, a covenant. In other words, its purpose is not for bare theoretical knowledge, but for a, a vitality of life that's lived in communion with God, both experientially and morally. And so Voss says this in one of his lectures. He says, God has not revealed himself in a school, but in the covenant. And the covenant as a communion with life is all comprehensive, embracing all the conditions and interests of those contracting it. There is a knowledge and an imparting of knowledge here, but in a most practical way and not merely by theoretical instruction. He says, he goes on to say this, the knowledge of God that's communicated by Scripture, is nowhere for a purely intellectual purpose. From beginning to end, it is a knowledge intended to enter into the actual life of man, to be worked out by him in all its practical bearings. That's what Scripture is for, to bring us into communion with God and to give vitality to the life that we live before the face of God. Psalm 119 I've been focusing on that a lot, both in Matthew, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, and in James, because it gives such a a beautiful picture of that, that life uh, lived in joy and fellowship with God in light of His commandments. And in verse 7, it says this, I will, of Psalm 119, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. So the knowing of Psalm 119 is, is a, is a knowing that feeds into your life that is lived before the face of God. I will praise you when I learn your righteous rules. What kind of a knowing is that? If you don't truly know what Scripture is teaching, you will not do what it says. But if you do know it in the way that is intended you will do what it says. So then the more meaningfully, the more humbly, and the more honestly you interact with Scripture, trusting that the Spirit is working through at the same time, the more, practically speaking, the more you will be drawn into communion with God. This is why it's, it's not improper. Anytime I read a, a book on pastoral theology or the the life of the pastor early on, usually in introduction or chapter one, there is some mention made of the the fact that there is a proper expectation that ministers are to be exemplary in their holiness. Why? Because their life is meant to be bathed in Scripture, and they're meant to bring these truths to the people of God. And if it is done honestly and genuinely from faith, expecting and trusting the Spirit, then one would naturally expect their life to reflect that very kind of thing. And so uh, Thomas Murphy says this. He says, The pastor is but a man, and 
That is certainly true. I can attest to it. The pastor is but a man, and the struggle against sin and imperfections must constantly be carried on in him as well as in other men. At the same time, it is true that high-toned principle and consistency are expected of him, and it is right that they should. Everything in the heart experience which he is supposed to have passed through and the profession which he has made, the sacred office to which he is called, the superior advantages for sanctity which he has had, and in the holy influences which he is appointed to teach, all these justify the expectation that he will be a man of more than ordinary godliness. A life that's lived within Scripture, in the light of Scripture, to have those advantages of sanctity, as Murphy says, means that one would expect that they would be exemplary in their holiness. Why? Well, it has nothing to do with the, the value or the intelligence of the minister. It's all about the power of God working in and through his word. There's nothing, uh, perhaps nothing, that's more of a, a death sentence for a congregation than a minister who is good at talking about the Bible and bad at living it out. A pastor who does not know the word in the James sense cannot teach it in the James sense. What kind of a knower are you? What kind of knowers are we? And this, of course, is connected to the kind of hearers that we are. Some people come to this passage in James, very famous passage in James, and they say, well, what James is probably uh, inveighing against is the dismissive hearer, the person who kind of comes to church and just says, oh, whatever, you know, I'm really, not really going to pay attention, but I'm just kind of here to check the box. And that's really, if you consider it, that's not what James is primarily addressing. This is really a warning for those who take great interest in Scripture, those who listen intently, who believe that they understand it well. And even though they listen intently and perhaps take great delight in the theoretical knowledge of the Bible, they are deceived. Those who say, well, I'm fine because I understand all of this. I'm fine because I understand the way salvation works. I'm fine because I know lots of things about the Scriptures, and I even like to learn things about the Bible. Those who would rely on the theoretical knowledge that they have and allow that to be their confidence as to whether or not they are in a right standing with God deceive themselves. It seems to be that that kind of thing uh, that Paul talks about in 2 Timothy where he speaks of those who have the appearance of godliness but they deny its power. They do not have the internal reality of a changed heart. Doug Moo, in his James commentary, says this, People can think they are right with God when they really are not. And so it is for those people who hear the word, regular church attenders, seminary students, and even seminary professors, but do not do it. They are mistaken in thinking that they are truly right with God, for God's word cannot be divided into two parts. If one wants the benefits of its saving power, one must also embrace it as a guide for life. The person who fails to do the word, James therefore suggests, is a person who has not truly accepted God's word at all. So that brings us back to where we began today. That brings us back to where we ended last week. Accepting the word. To accept the word of God is to hear it in its fullness. To understand that it confronts us with a life that is to be lived. And to do everything we can in order to see our life produce obedience. Have you received the word? Or have you deceived yourself? Have you received the word? Or have you deceived yourself? Do you see, secondly, do you see that in Christ you are free. Do you see that in Christ you are free? James uses this nice picture for us, the example of a mirror. Back then, uh, mirrors were kind of little shiny pieces of metal, and in order to to see yourself, it really demanded your focus. Uh, You you needed to have a a careful and concentrated look into a, a piece of metal in order to really see something about your appearance. 
And so that is uh, one of the connections being made with this, with this illustration. That is the way you are to look into Scripture. They didn't have the crystal clear wall-sized mirrors that we have today. It was this careful, concentrated look. And that is the way you are supposed to look at Scripture, with a careful and a concentrated focus. But there are those who forget. And so we have this remembering and forgetting in this passage. And those who willingly forget, here it's, this is not necessarily just a, a bare ability of memory, but it is those who fail to live, those who forget are those who fail to live in light of what God has done or fail to live in light of what Scripture calls us to do. Using the passage that we looked at last week, be, everyone should be uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Uh, there may be many people who say, well, I, I, I don't remember exactly how the verses go throughout Scripture, but I know that God has called me to not be sinfully angry. So as I live my life, I'm going to strive to do that, to not be sinfully angry. I know I'm not supposed to live in anger. And that is remembering to a certain extent, right? Forgetting would be disregarding that and not living in light of it. In the Old Testament, God demanded that the Israelites not forget his mighty acts. Remember that I've saved you. Remember that I have brought you out of Egypt. Remember that I brought you into the promised land. Remember and be grateful. Deuteronomy chapter 8 says this, when your herds and flocks multiply, this is God speaking to Israel, when your herds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. And then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness. Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. You see, remembering is a call to live in light of what God has done, to bring to mind his goodness and his salvation and to be affected by his goodness. Once again, Doug Moo in his James commentary says, to remember God and his acts and his teachings is to contemplate them in such a way that they make a lasting impression on the heart and the mind. The person who forgets what he has seen in God's word is one who reads or listens superficially, not imprinting the message on the soul. Do you contemplate what God has done in such a way that they make a lasting impression on your heart and your mind. Everyone has different abilities in regards to memorization and those kinds of things. And that's not to say memorization is not important. It most certainly is. But do you remember God's word in such a way that it stamps you, makes a lasting impression upon you, and affects the course of your life, the way that you live and the decisions that you make? I appreciate it. This is very encouraging to me, but uh, many of you, way, way more than usual, and this is not me, you know, fishing for compliments or anything like that, but many of you last week uh, commented on how much you, you appreciated the sermon and how much it, it convicted you uh, or brought things to, to your mind that you realized you needed to do. But uh, to listen to that sermon and to appreciate it the day that you have heard it, right, that is the, the, the gaze into the mirror, uh, to appreciate it seven days later, 14 days later, two months later. That is to be stamped by it. So I'm not saying that I need this for many of you. But if anyone were to say to a pastor, you know, I really appreciated that sermon you preached three months ago. And that has really stayed with me. And that has really changed the way that I act or I live. Those are the kinds of things that James, that's the kind of thing that James is, is talking about. That long, careful gaze is meant to propel us to action, to live for God and His glory, to strive to do what the Word says. 
When I was in seventh grade, I still remember this day and the, the feelings, the embarrassment, because uh, I remember as the day was going on, more people started making comments. There was something that was appearing on my face. So I'm in seventh grade, so there's a, a big blemish that's appearing on my face, and I was being teased by it. Very embarrassing experience for me. I'm totally, I'm fine about it, don't worry. But it was kind of a, a troubling day. And I remember, I finally go into the bathroom and look in the mirror, and I see that there's this big thing on my face, this big blemish that has appeared on my face. And you should have seen, I mean, I rode, how fast I rode my bike home after school. I, I mean, I wanted to crawl into a hole and hide, but I stayed at school the rest of the day. But I, I ride my bike so fast home, and I come through the door, and you should have seen the way that I was propelled to action. Mom, what should I do? What do I do first? Tell me what to do. You need to go to the store, Mom. You need to buy every cream that they have you need to sterilize the needle. You need to get the, the hot rag ready for me. All these kinds of things. Nobody can do anything until I've taken care of this situation. I'm not going back to school like this again tomorrow. I probably wasn't prepared for the, uh, the kinds of challenges I would face in the next six years in, in the, same kind of, uh, the same kind of way. But this vaulted me into action. I took action immediately. What I saw in the mirror moved me. What I saw in the mirror made me take action. And if you hear something from God's word that is like that, that exposes a problem that you know is there in your heart, like putting you in front of a mirror and you see a big blemish there, the question that James is posing is, will you take action in light of what God has shown to you in his word? Will it stamp you and your life? Will it affect what you do? John Owen has a great, uh, wonderful spiritual work, The mortif Mortification of Sin. And uh, he says this, Keep watch against any breakout of your sin. No pun intended there, I suppose. Keep watch against any breakout of your sin. Consider the ways, the people, the opportunities, the activities, and the conditions that have in the past led to sin, especially if it happens often, and be extremely watchful about all of them. Understand and know how you fall into sin. Rearrange your life according to it. Then, he says, you must act quickly and forcefully against your sin as soon as you find out it is acting against you. Fight fast and fight hard. Don't let it get any ground. Rise up and fight with all your strength against it. When God's word exposes something in our lives, will we take drastic action? Or will we be the kind of hearer that is deceived that James warns us about? Well, James also thankfully brings us then to a couple of things that remind us of the power to fight, the power to fight. Here, Scripture, and in some sense of probably talking about um, a holistic uh, view of Scripture, James says those who look into the, the perfect law, the law of liberty, what does he mean by that? Well, we don't have time to totally unpack it. You could probably do a a whole, a whole sermon or a whole sermon series just on this idea of the, the law of liberty. What James is alluding to is the, the law of God, the instruction from God's word or all of scripture as it has come to be known and understood in Jesus Christ. Jesus, of course, does not change the law of God, but he fulfills it. And he brings it to its fullest interpretation, right? He, it's like he brings it into the brightest light. And the point is, if we are united to Christ, he sets us free from the condemning power of the law. In Jesus Christ, those who are joined in, in covenant union with him to bring that covenant idea back, right? Scripture is not a school, it's a covenant. Those who are joined in covenant union with Jesus Christ by faith, uh, they, the, the power of the law is not one that condemns the law becomes a delight. 
It's a joyful realization of freedom. As we look to Jesus Christ and all that he has done, as we considered earlier this morning, he was rich, became poor, so that he might do in us what is impossible to do in and of ourselves, not only to be freed from condemnation, but also to live in ways that are pleasing unto God, to joyfully give all that we have in order to serve and love and honor Christ. For freedom, Christ has set us free. And so, uh, the law of liberty, the perfect law, is to look at all of Scripture and to see how Jesus Christ is right at the center of it. And that to know and understand the main thrust of Scripture is to see if you are united to the truly blessed one, because James says, the one who does what is good, the one who does what is right, the one who obeys the word of God, he is the one who will be blessed in his doing. Well, that begins with Jesus Christ. And then so the main thrust of Scripture is if you are united to that truly blessed one, you are freed from the condemning power of the law. The righteous standard will never be able to be brought against you as an instrument of condemnation, but rather we are freed then uh, to live for God in his glory. And that brings us again to that covenant idea. The covenant idea as the main thrust of Scripture means that in uh, the central acts of redemptive history, we are not spectators. We are participants. So at the cross of Calvary, in Jesus' death, we died if we're united to him. In his death, we died and our sin was dealt with there. In his resurrection, we are raised. In his life we live. In his session in heaven we are seated. He raised us up and seated us with him in Christ in the heavenly places. The thrust of scripture is that we don't view these things from afar. We participate in these things. And thus living in Christ, in the power of the life that he gives in this covenant union, is the power by which we become doers of the word. Because we hear that it begins in union with the Son of God. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. It's that wonderful uh, encouragement at the end. He will be blessed in his doing. And as we said, that begins with Jesus Christ. He is the truly blessed one. Look at the reward. Look at uh, the enjoyment that Christ has of obtaining a bride, of obtaining uh, eternal blessedness, a name above every name as the one who gave it all and then was raised up to heaven uh, in glory. But it reminds us too that as we strive in these ways to be doers of the word by God's grace united to Jesus Christ, that there is blessing simply in being a doer of the word. Do you believe? That blessedness, no matter your circumstances, blessedness is found in obeying God's word. Blessedness is found in doing God's word. Brings us back to Psalm 119. Blessed are those whose way is blameless. Blessed are those who keep his testimony, who seek him with their whole heart. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. I've had a couple of uh, college friends, roommates, uh, who have converted either to Roman Catholicism or to to Eastern Orthodoxy, and all of our theological discussions now, it seems like they're always wanting to talk about uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I found this verse to be so interesting as I was thinking about these things. Luke 11, verse 27, a woman in the crowd raises her voice to Jesus and says to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. This woman looks to Jesus and says, there is something that is amazing about this man. And because there's something that is so amazing about him, then, wow, blessed is the woman who bore him. Now, of course, Mary has said, uh, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. That is true, and we can hold to that and, and emphasize it. But Jesus says this, he said, blessed is the womb that bore you. And, and, but he said, Jesus says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed rather, not blessed also, not blessed alongside of, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and 
keep it. So we need to hear and see and believe that there is blessing in hearing and keeping and doing the word of God. And that as we see lives that are eaten up by sin, we need to remind ourselves that blessing is found in doing the word of God, and that we will be blessed in our doing, even as we do them as united to Christ, always trusting in the gospel, always trusting in God's grace, never believing that it's our righteousness that wins any position before God. Yet he gives us this promise, you will be blessed in your doing. So look to the law of liberty today, the law of freedom. See your life in Christ's life. In his death, you died. In his resurrection, you were raised. In his life, you live. In his session, you are seated. See your life in Christ's life. And ask God for wisdom as to how you might take drastic action in your life against your sin that you might be a doer of the word. James says earlier in chapter 1, God delights to bestow upon us wisdom. He gives it liberally to those who ask. So there's a sense in which we say, well, that's nice. I, I understand that. It's great to know that God gives wisdom to those who ask. But it's not meant to, to just be chewed on that way and to think that it's nice that God gives wisdom. James tells us that so that we might pray longingly, daily, for wisdom, in order that we might know ways in which we would live for him. Ask God for wisdom as to how you might take drastic action to do battle against the sin in your life so that you might be a doer of the word. The Bible is not a school. It's a covenant. Live in that covenant union with Christ today and all the days of your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask that you teach us to humbly accept the word that's planted in us. And as we consider these, uh, these weighty words and commands, um, we're reminded that uh, we need your help and, and we need your grace. Well, Father, um, make Christ all the more glorious to us as we see him, the truly blessed one, the one who loved righteousness and, and hated wickedness, uh, the one who uh, received that, that blessing, that anointing, and that uh, oil drips down from him, uh, upon him, and down to those who follow him in his train. We thank you for the Holy Spirit given to us to bring that life of Christ uh, to a living and vital reality. And uh, we pray for help for anyone here um, who may need uh, these very words today. Uh, that you might do a mighty work in hearts and lives for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. We sing the first two verses and the last two verses of number 462. 462, one, two, five, and six, take my life and let it be, stand together and sing. 462 in the blue.
receive God's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.